Our Father, we thank you for sounding the call again that you have sent us. And Father, we pray that the real way to follow through that calling you will reveal to us in Jesus' name. As you sent your only begotten Son, so you are also sending us. And we pray we will not fail, we will not fall by the way. Father, that will follow through until the very end in Jesus' name. Help us once again to hear your voice this morning. And as we hear your voice, may something rise up in our hearts saying, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord who has brought us over this period of time. And we thank the Lord for the little we have been able to learn. Obviously, we need to learn more. And if Jesus tarries, I believe that this will not be the last kind of conference we attend that will shake us up and remind us once again what our calling is. But we thank the Lord for the much that has been revealed. I'm sure that you have heard enough at this seminar or conference that will take the grace of God alone to be able to follow through and to understand what it is the Lord is calling you for and to truthfully, wholeheartedly, faithfully, honestly, follow everything. I want to round up the whole thing with uh, this message, the blessedness of possessing nothing. It's a message that is contrary to human nature. A message that looks like a paradox in itself. Because we think we are blessed when we possess a lot of things. And yet I'm about to tell you that the stage of blessedness, where there is absolute peace, trust in the Lord, no worry, no anxiety, no looking back, no fear for the future, that you know that you are totally in the hands of God, the most blessed stage is that state of mind that possesses nothing. The blessedness of possessing nothing. In Luke chapter 9 from verse 57 to verse 58 and it came to pass that as they went in the way a certain man said unto him, Lord I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have folds, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Here we find the Lord Jesus Christ on the one hand, the possessor of all things, stating that he possessed nothing. I will find a man that had nothing, nothing of eternal value, wanting to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord told him, you are taking a good decision. But then try to understand the decision you are taking. You are coming to follow a life of blessedness, of possessing nothing. A man could not see any blessedness in possessing nothing. He couldn't see that the lamb that had nothing is still going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah that will rule over all things. He couldn't see the paradox of the Christian life or the paradox of following the Lord, having nothing yet possessing all things. And because of this, we read about him that he did not really follow the Lord. He couldn't follow the Lord. We don't see any record that he followed. There are many people like that because of possession. Because of what you have, 
what you don't have, what you see, what you cannot see, what you handle, or what you cannot taste. Because of all these things, they are not able to follow. In Luke chapter 14, and in verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all things that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Again, this is contrary to human nature. From childhood, you know that we grieve, we grab whatever we have. You see a little child trying to suck milk out of the mother. And the child, the attitude and the grief that the child has, it's like, this is mine, I possess. And have you seen when that uh, little child has a junior brother or a junior sister, baby brother, baby sister? And that baby brother or baby sister has to suck out milk from the mother. Oh, the senior one will cry and kick and beat that other one and push because this is mine. Why are you taking hold of it? That's human nature. And since, uh, you know, we've been young, we've been trying to greet things and grab things and possess things and acquire things. And Jesus said, would you like to be a disciple? We like to be a follower of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. You must have the willingness to forsake all things. Because whosoever he be of you, that retains that nature that we are born with, that will grip and grab and acquire and possess, and will never let go and let God have his way, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever he be of you, that will not forsake all that he has, all that he has, he cannot and will not be my disciple. The blessedness of possessing nothing. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. It will take being born again to understand this. And I don't care all the grammar, all the English a man will know. I don't care all the uh, text that a person may read, if he's not born again, you bring him to a verse like this, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It says, uh, that's what we're saying, that the Bible is a contradictory kind of book. Sorrowful, rejoicing. Poor, making many rich. Having nothing, possessing all things. Unbelievers will not understand. Because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. It's only when Christ comes in. And you know the peace that the Lord has given. And you know the salvation of the Lord in your heart, in your soul. That you will understand. Persecution may come. Sickness may even be there. Family problems may even be there. On the one hand, your flesh is feeling the bite of the persecution, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Watch Stephen at the point of death. And see that man, he had no reason at all, humanly speaking, to rejoice. He was throwing stones at him, and yet you'll wonder why he didn't regret he was a Christian. He still had a spirit of forgiveness, of joy in the Lord, he knew he was going home. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Look at all the apostles. Lord, we are forsaking all things, and yet making many rich. Look at Paul the apostle. He tells a story about himself. I profited in the Jewish religion more than all my equals, but now he became a person for whom the world was not worthy. Away with this fellow. Get rid of them. He ought to die. He's a criminal. He went from prison to prison. 
and yet in the night of affliction he was seen. He had nothing he looked for, but see how many people he had made rich. See how many lives had been changed from that first century, even until this time, though dead, yet speaketh, having nothing, yet possessing all things. When you eventually see those apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, ruling over the twelve tribes of Israel, when you eventually see their names on the gates of the new Jerusalem, when you eventually see their mansions, when you eventually see how they become part of the symbolic elders that laid their crowns before the feet of the Lamb, you will understand that when they were here, it appeared they possessed nothing. But now you can see that they possess all things. In Mark chapter 8, verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall save it. The human heart is very deceptive. Spiritual eyes can easily grow dim and even become blind. We who are children of God, we sometimes will think that the hearts of the unbelievers are deceptive. That's true. But you know, even for us, except we allow the light of the gospel to constantly shine, except we allow the perfect example of the Lord Jesus Christ to be constantly before us, except we're looking constantly at the lives and the attitudes of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ that followed the Lord in the early times, except we're looking at the Word of God, except we bring eternity very close to our mind, every waking moment and every waking hour, our eyes will grow dim. We will appear like we are saying, why am I like this? Why am I a Christian? Why am I a Christian worker? Because I don't have any right on this. I don't have any hold on this. Except we have eternity. Very, very close every time. Our hearts that are supposed to be temples of the Almighty could easily become so possessive of material things that God is dethroned. You see, when you look at a Christian and you look at a Christian minister to you and he says, my property, my house, my wife, my child, this, that, everything mine. You will see that a lot of us need a second higher level of conversion. See, there is a kind of conversion that takes you out of the way of hell and brings you to the way of heaven. There is another kind of uh, conversion that fits you for that heaven. It's like Israel had been taken out of Egypt. Great conversion. But then to take Egypt out of Israel, another kind of level. Another level of conversion that many people need. And if we do not have this second kind of conversion, and this level of spirituality, we may find that the converted heart, on the basis of that first conversion, will soon become selfish and possessive. That the more you are in the Christian fold and in the Christian race, the less you are like Jesus Christ. And we ought to be making progress. But if you look at your attitude, you may, feel, you may see that even at the early time of your conversion, you are more flexible and pliable and humble and meek in the hands of the Lord than right now. You may feel, you may find that at the early time of conversion, you are actually willing and able to give up much than you are able to give up now. We may find that we are slowly becoming degenerate and the spiritual life is slowly getting decayed, selfishness and possessive attitude coming in. And we're no more enjoying the blessedness of possessing nothing. Christ, the creator of all things, possessed 
nothing on earth. Nothing on earth. After Jesus died, there was nothing for the apostles to share. Nothing that they will say, this is the amount of money he left. There was uh, nothing to fight about on house and property. He didn't leave any house behind. He said, all the house I'm going to give you is up there, nothing over here. I go to prepare a place for you. When I finish preparing that, I will come again. And, you know, he had mother, earthly mother, Mary. And as he was going to die, if there was any property, he loved Mary so much because Mary herself was a real believer, a devout woman. And a woman that Jesus Christ would like to care for as the mother. And at the cross, he said, woman, he couldn't say, remember that house, though I'm going, don't be sorrowful. You can keep that, take that, and uh, if you cannot occupy the whole thing, you can give the other part to rent, and then you'll be having resources, some funds. But said, mother, behold your child. That's my disciple. I can give him to you. And son, John, look at your mother. Take care of him for me. Because, you know, I've not left anything behind. No money, no house, no land, nothing. Now, disciples, I'm sorry I couldn't leave any money behind, but as I'm going away, I will send the Holy Ghost unto you. That's enough for you. You know, if we are believers, we need to know what Christ has given unto us. And instead of saying, God, are you, are you going to give me money, increase my salary, increase my remuneration, increase this and increase that, the Lord says, oh, I'm sorry. I don't think I can give you all that. I don't think I can give you more house, more land, more resources, more vehicle, more of this, but I will send the Holy Ghost unto you in a greater measure, in a mighty measure. The fire will come upon you. What I possess, that's what I possess when I was here, what I possess and I got the job done, that is what I will send unto you. Thank God the early disciples never, they ne they never said no. Good, we need Holy Ghost, but we also need houses. We need Holy Ghost, but we also need money. We need Holy Ghost, but we also need this. They accepted what Jesus offered unto them. And I think that if we're going to get back into the New Testament Christianity, the Holy Ghost should be enough for us. Am I right? Once we have the Holy Ghost, we have the promises of God. We have the ability to pray. We have faith in God. And we have mansions up in the sky. Then our mind to rest about whatever we possess, whatever we don't possess. Do you know the Lord is still calling us today. He has not changed. One, he wants us to give him our heart. That our heart will be his possession. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. 26, my son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Once again, the Lord is still calling us. He's saying, you cannot even think the way you like to think. And property cannot take hold of your heart. The possessive spirit or possessive attitude cannot take hold of your heart and of your mind. Give me that heart. That's my throne. I want to stay there. My son, give me thine heart. And it is not only at conversion. You should take up every, every way. That is every mile of the way. As you are following the Lord Jesus Christ, when you wake up in the morning, ask yourself, all these things I see around, the house I live, the gadget I have, the material things I have, are they in my heart? If they are taken away, will I feel so much sorrow? If I do not possess them again, would I have any problem? If the Lord were to call me now and say, well, I don't generally tell people that I'm calling them home, if the Lord should tell you that, but I love you so much, I'm going to tell you that I'm calling you home. And, uh, you know, the Lord will say, 
say bye-bye to the people. I've finished your mansion on high. Come over. Is your heart going to say, Oh Lord, we've just bought bridge. I've not enjoyed it. We've just bought a new car. I've not enjoyed it. Delay this call to heaven. Delay this call to such and such, uh, you know, a glorious thing. And let me enjoy. We've just had a new baby. And uh, we're going to have the naming ceremony tomorrow. Lord, don't call me home today. Let me enjoy something better than heaven before I go. You see the heart of man. When God is telling us that we should be free from the heart that is possessive of the sand and the dust of the earth, we're clinging to it. But God is saying, my son, give me your heart. If you say you are born again, if you say you are a child of God, do not allow these material things of the world to come and sit on your heart. Give that heart completely unto the Lord. Not only that, the Lord is saying, give me your children. Don't hold on to that child. Give that child to the Lord. You see, there are people, the way they talk to their children or the way husband and wife will talk together, they would say, I know the demands of the Christian ministry. And these two or three children we have, it's enough that this family has given me up for the work of the Lord. And here we are, I'm here today, I'm there tomorrow. Well, that's the contract I've signed with God. But I don't want these children to suffer. What do you mean? You don't want them to serve God? You don't want them to become another Paul, another John, another Peter? You don't want them to suffer? You don't want your children to go to prison for Jesus' sake? You don't want your children to be once a night in the deep and then in shipwreck? You do not want your children to have a combat against the devil fighting for the glory of God. You don't want your children to taste of the fire and the heat of the way in preparing people for the kingdom of God. You know, when you hear the way we talk and we say, I know what I'm going through. I know what I've gone through. I know what I've given up. And I do not want any of these, my children, to serve the Lord. But give me your children too. Don't lay hold on your children and possess that child as if this is mine, this is mine. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm reading there in verse 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son I see, whom thou lovest. And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Abraham here was called upon that he will possess nothing. And I, I want you to follow the life of Abraham. Abraham, from the very beginning, had been detached from material things. Oh yes, God blessed him. God blessed him. But then he had the willingness and he enjoyed the blessedness of possessing nothing. The very first test that came to his life is when Abraham's herdsman and Lord's herdsman, when they had conflict. And Abraham said, Lord, don't let there be any strife between me and you, between the herdsmen serving me and those serving you. Look out and see the land. Choose any one you have, any part you want, and then the rest I will take. What is that? That's the attitude of holding on to nothing. He didn't say, I have the right. Don't claim your right. He didn't say, I'm the one that God called. And if God calls somebody, he blesses the person. And the blessing God has given me, you are trying to take away from me. I am going to fight this matter with fasting, with prayer, with faith, with everything that I have. Not Abraham. If you are going to fight any battle, fight for the salvation of people. 
if we are going to fight any battle, fight for the deliverance of other people. If we are going to fast and pray about anything, don't let it be on property, on money, on material things. And Abraham said, Lord, go your way. Choose whatever you like. And then he chose the well-watered place. And the rest of the place that remained was shallow and dry and almost having nothing. And then Lot never built any altar. He wasn't a prayerful fellow. Abraham went to the dry side and he built an altar for the Lord and he worshipped the Lord. And, Ab and God said, Abraham, said, here am I. That's always the answer that Abraham will give. He said, look up, north, south, east, west, even the place where Lot is now, don't mind him. To you have I given everything. The blessedness of possessing nothing, having nothing, yet possessing all things. I but Lot, on the other hand, Lot, on the other hand, he seemed to have possessed much, he lost everything in the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. But that was not the only thing with Abraham. Lot had been taken, and his wives had been taken, and the people had been taken uh, by these kings that came, and they had war with Sodom. Abraham heard about it. Now, if Abraham were another fellow, he will say, that serves him right. He got all that property. Now they have ejected him out of the property. God will fight for me, not Abraham. Abraham got his servants together again, old man, and then he ran after those people and defeated them, and he brought back Lord's wife, everybody, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and a lot of property, and see them coming into the place and carrying all the booties and all the property. And Abraham never said, now, uh, this uh, king of Sodom, hidden king, he may not be intelligent enough that when somebody starts you pay him, let me pay myself before he cheat me. Therefore, you take that and take that and take that and take it to my tent. Never. He brought everything right to the gate of Sodom. And the king of Sodom said, Abraham, we appreciate what you have done. We will take our people, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, but you take all the property that will pay you for what you have done. Abraham said, king of Sodom, take what you have. I've raised my hand to the Lord Almighty that I will not take a thread, shoe lashes, from what belongs to Sodom, lest you should say, because I know I'm going to become rich, but lest you will say, I, king of Sodom, made Abraham rich. My name will never be in your mouth that you are the one that made me rich. Take all that you have. Can you see the blessedness of possessing nothing? And eventually, he had Ishmael. Great, great deviation from his normal lifestyle. And he had no, ch no other child. And his heart was on this Ishmael and Hagar. But then there was a problem. And Sarah said, drive out this woman. And drive out the child. And Abraham, this time, he felt unhappy about it. Then the Lord came to him and said, Abraham, even though he was sorrowful, sorrowful but rejoicing, even though he felt perplexed that, ah, ah, Sarah, you are the one that told me to go into this woman, and now Ishmael has come. The son of a uh, promise we're expecting has not come. Let's keep this one. Sarah, why are you hard on this? Hagar like this. God, at that time, he was thinking like that. God came and said, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, Obey the voice of your wife and drive out that woman and the child. Yes, Lord, immediately. That's the willingness of possessing nothing. You see, Abraham did not lay hold on this Ishmael and say, I've got this, I've got this. And then drove them away, just they gave him a bottle of water and bread, and they went. After Hagar had gone, Ishmael had gone, then God said, Abraham, he said, here am I. And then God said, what do you have left now? Well, is this my child, Isaac? Take that son now, Isaac, the son of your old age, and go and sacrifice him to me in a mountain I will show you. Can you bear that? You've lost property. You've lost money. All the reward they wanted to give you from Sodom, you rejected. Lord had gone. 
you have no French. All the other people, king of Gera, when you got to their territory, you got into problem with them. You are going from here to here, building tents and building, uh, building altar, worshiping the Lord. And the very last thing you have, God said, now give me that son. And Abraham didn't argue, didn't say, could that be the Lord? The blessedness of possessing of him. No worry, no anxiety, no regret, no remorse, no sorrow over that sin. Early in the morning, he got up. And as he was uh, going on the way, he put the wood on his boy. And he had two servants. And he said, you stay over here. I and this lad will go over there and worship. It is not singing that we call worship. It is not just when you pray and speak in tongues we call worship. It is when you open your hand before the Lord and say, Lord, take everything. It's for you. I lavish my love on you. I lavish everything I have on you. Take everything that I have and let me just completely belong to you. That's worship. I and this lad will go yonder and will go and worship. And he got over there. He laid the wood. Old man. The man that really followed the Lord. And he stretched his boy upon the altar. And he took the knife. And he wanted to kill the child. He will do anything for God. And you know, Jesus had not come at that time. He only saw him afar off. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it, he rejoiced. And um, when he, laid, he wanted to lay hand on the child, the angel said, Abraham, Abraham. Lay not your hand on this child, because now I know that you fear me, and you love me so much, because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And then he saw the ram. He took that ram and sacrificed. And then God said, after he sacrificed, he called him again and he said, in blessing, I will bless you. The blessedness of possessing nothing. You hold on to it, you lose it. You give it up, it becomes yours. You fight for your right, I must have it, I must keep it, I must hold it. Everything will be taken away from you. But you say, Lord, I don't have anything. I don't want anything. All I want is just to serve you with all my heart, all my soul, and I don't want to possess anything. Those are the people that are blessed of the Lord. And so, God is asking us, number one, give me your heart. God is asking you, number two, give me your children. You have any children? Consecrate them to the Lord. You have any children? Say that, Lord, as I am serving you, if you will call my children to, and your grace will be upon my children, I'll be delighted, I'll be so happy. You'll be preparing them for the ministry, for serving the Lord. And then, number three, you give up your human dependence to lean. On him alone. That is, all the things that naturally you will want to lean upon. You give everything up so that you can lean upon the Lord alone. In Luke chapter 14, from verse 26, Luke 14, 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You see, sometimes uh, there are times that in our own foolishness, and in our own forgetfulness, the wife will tell the husband and say, ah, look, my husband, this uh, service you are giving to the Lord. Remember, you are married now. You are no more a bachelor. The implication is, before I came to your home, you had this consecration, you had this commitment, but understand that now you are married. And as I married you, I'm not, I don't think it's right for me to say I'm going to suffer. Therefore, please understand, whatever consecration you are making, Whatever service you are doing, remember, you are now a married man. Now, you see, when you talk like that, you are thinking of your life. You are not thinking of the kingdom. 
you're not thinking of Jesus Christ. It says, except he hates father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also. You see, sometimes when we speak and, you know, we say, oh, the church, referring to deeper life, should realize that we're older than when we came into the ministry. I mean, now I'm 40, now I'm 45, now I am 35, and, uh, you know, when you get old, you need more care. When you do this, you, you need more of this and more of that. The church will realize that now we are older than when we came in. You see, when you say that, you do not hate your life and hate every pampering and every petting and all these uh, pleasures of the flesh. I'm not talking about sin now. I'm talking about the things that cares for the flesh. But Jesus said the call I give you is that you will hate father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and ye, his own life also, that if you don't, does he say, if you don't hate your very life also, you cannot be an apostle? No. You cannot be an evangelist? No. You cannot be a teacher? No. You cannot even be a disciple. Not to talk of being an apostle. Not to talk of being an evangelist. Not to talk of being a teacher or being a pastor in a church. If you cannot forget everything, leave everything behind and hate your very life also. You cannot be his disciple. Verse 27, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If there is a cross to bear, praise the Lord, bear it and be joyful about it. He's calling us that we'll give up all that we have. Whatever it is, that we give everything away for the glory of God. We are called to serve selflessly without an eye on material gain. If you look at all the qualifications I read to you yesterday when I was talking on Judas and money, I read to you from Exodus, I read to you from Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, I read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 3, I read to you from Titus. If you look at all those passages I read to you, you will see that the Bible gives very clearly the qualifications of the people that are to be used in the service of the Lord. And it says they hate covetousness. It says they fear the Lord. It says they are not greedy or filthy looker. It says that they are faithful. It says they are honest in all things. And you will not see in those same passages the salary they are to be paid. Very quiet on that. It just tells them they must hate covetousness. It just tells them they must hate property, hate this one, hate this one. Remuneration? Salary? What are we going to get? No answer. When Jesus called the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He talks about that spiritual side. He kept quiet on the other area. How do you understand that? It's the blessedness of possessing nothing. And then when he was going to send them out, he said, I'm sending you out two by two. Now those of you that even have a pause, at that post uh, missionary trip, don't even take it. You have uh, two suits or whatever, just the one you are wearing is the one you go with. And don't take any extra with you. If anybody greets you, by the way, now, this is not a social trip. Uh, don't even greet them. Go your way and go and preach the kingdom of God. That's all that you are going to do. And eventually, it was when he was leaving, he said, Now, I'm going. If you have pause now, you can take it. But when you read that, you'll be wondering, Okay, now he has not permitted them. Whatever you have, you can now take. But what? What did they really have? You know the accounts. Because uh, Judas was not rendering, you know, the real returns. And uh, even as bold as Peter was, Peter was not able to challenge Judas Iscariot. Nobody could challenge that man. And uh, he had his way. And uh, by the time he was going to hang himself, he was going to die. Did he bring all the money back to the apostles? 
they had nothing. Even when Jesus said, now I'm going away, anyone that has any pulse, anyone that has this, let him take everything. What are they going to take? For three and a half years, they have not been working. And the little money they have had been in the care of Judas Iscariot. When uh, it came to Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, what did you see? What property were they sharing in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1? They had nothing. But they were just praying and waiting upon the Lord, waiting for the Holy Ghost. Look away from all this salary, money, property, house, equipment, chair, and all that. Wait for the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes, everything will change. And you know, if you have the Holy Ghost, what else do you need? You have the power from above. You have the insight into the Word of God. You speak and, you know, people get converted. The people that get converted, they will build the church. The people that get converted, all the things that need to be done will be done. All we need is the Holy Ghost. If we have the Holy Ghost, we have enough. Am I right? What we need more of the Holy Ghost, more of the power of God, more of the grace of God. And you see many churches, they'll be running after this and running after this and running after that. They forget the Holy Ghost. Our prayer should be, oh Lord, give me more of the Holy Ghost. And when you have the Holy Ghost, everything will uh, be set right, will be set in place. We must pray that God will take things away from our hearts, will take places of people out of our hearts so that he himself can reign without a rival. You see the old nature, the ancient nature, as old as the human nature that had been in us, will not go out very easily, painlessly. It must be torn out of the heart like a plant torn out from the soil, extracted in agony with, and blood, like a tooth is torn out of the jaw. It must be expelled. That is, the human nature that likes to possess this and hold on to this, must be expelled from the soul by the violence that Christ expelled the money changers out of the temple. Before we can truly say, with Christ, not my will, but thine be done, we must kneel in the garden of Gethsemane. You see, if you're a child of God, visit Gethsemane. Pray and sweat, even if you have to sweat blood, and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. As God led Abraham to go through the way of renunciation, testing him, they will lead every one of us to go through the way of renunciation, testing us. At the time of that test, Abraham did not know it was a test. At the time of your own test and my own test, you may not know, I may not know, it is a test. Yet, I need to tell you this. If Abraham had taken some other way, some other course, other than the way of submission that he took, the history of the Old Testament would have been drastically different. God would have chosen another man to replace him, like he chose David to replace Saul. But, thank God, he submitted. Thank God you are going to submit. And you are going to give yourself to the Lord. You see, it is blessed to possess nothing. There were two women. One had a child. The other had a child. They slept in the same place at night. And in the night, one woman was careless, slept over, his, over her baby. The baby died. In the morning, they woke up. One dead child, one living child. And uh, the fellow said, the one that is the real mother said, this is my child. The one that has the dead baby said, no, the dead baby is yours, the living is mine. And then they said, we cannot solve this problem. We go to the king, the counselor, and the judge. They got to Solomon. And they argued the one that has dead baby said, it's my child. The living one is my child. The dead is yours. The other woman that actually had the child said, but this one is my child. And so Abraham said, what are we going to do? The one says, the living is mine. The dead is yours. The other one says, the living is mine. The dead is yours. All right, bring a sword. Well, caught the 
living child into two and give you her and go your way. The one that didn't have the child said, that's all right, do it like that. Cut the child in two so it doesn't belong to anyone. The real mother said, I give up. I don't possess anything anymore. I hand over the child to the false mother. Solomon said, that's the mother. That's the mother. The blessedness of possessing nothing. Rise up and let us pray.